Hello. Give it a Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have some Asher stickers that I'll just leave here if you want them. Um, people generally want them. So, and if we run out, Alfonso uh, Garcia Caro um, has some in somewhere. I'll point to him. Just let me know that you want it. Um, so uh, today we're going to talk about <coughs> computational expressions. I'm going to do show of hands. Who writes code more or less every day? I have to start somewhere, cool. Um, so who writes uh, C-sharp all the time? Or C-sharp or Java or JavaScript, one of those? A little bit, okay. Who writes Scala every day? Cool, okay. Who writes uh, Haskell every day? Just for a crack. Idris every day? Cool, I just want to see his hand. Uh, <laughs> Closure every day? Cool. Cool, cool. nice. Um, so anyway, that was just to, to get you to see who's awake and who's paying attention. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> so uh, computation expressions in F# -sharp, um, um, are a thing, are, are a feature of the language. Uh, I, I'm going to mention the word monads a couple of times, and I don't want you all going like, oh, ah, ah, you can, because it's fun and it's, it has like the theatrical uh, effect, uh, but uh, you, you should be fine. Um, I'm not, this is not an in-depth talk about them. Uh, this is actually super light, and the whole reason for me to make this talk is to introduce this concept in the most easy possible way I could think of. Because when I, and, and not about just, just monads, uh, actually, to introduce computation expressions. Um, I do speak Spanish, so if you have questions and you feel uh, more comfortable asking in Spanish, ask them in Spanish, and I'll repeat the question in English for those of you who don't speak Spanish, because there's like three of us here. Um, so <laughs> anyway, uh, with, with that, so if you know loads about monads and you think this will be boring, I, I will cry on, um, you know, behind the thing, but you can totally go and it's probably, you know, it's no biggie. So anyway, with all of that out of the way, um, I'll start. By the way, these slides are made in um, FS Rebuild. They use uh, Rebuild.js. But you can write in uh, kind of with Markdown, but the whole kind of thing works on uh, with F Sharp. So if you're tired of writing your slides on PowerPoint or anything, you should give it a try. You know, as a kind of thing, as, hey, they can play with some F Sharp in, in some kind of nice way. So anyway, um, my name, that's my name, that's the thing. And this thing behind here is the game I've been working on for the last three years that it was just shipped to Steam. Hint, hint, you can buy it right now. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> um, my blog is uh, in this thing that you can't read called roundcrisis.com. My slides are already there because I'm that good, apparently. Uh, so I, I'll tweet about it too. My uh, handle is at silverspoon, you know, like a um, plata, um, cucharita de plata. Okay, so um, anyway. I'm showing you this game not just because it's a nice blog and it looks cool. You know, come on, look at that demon. Um, but also because the, it all started uh, on me looking at computation expressions uh, be because of it. You see, I wrote this game with um, a game engine, an open source <coughs> game engine called uh, Duality. Uh, this is in C Sharp. And uh, when some of the scripts, uh, you know, gameplay scripts, where, uh, you know, they're mostly in C-sharp because this is written by, uh, 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 you know, the team, not just me, and, and some of them, you know, just try to make something work. And, but I was like, okay, you know, I'd much rather write in, in F-sharp when I have to do stuff because I can, I will make less mistakes because I have a nice type system behind me, you know? So, and also shorter, less rules, blah, blah. Anyway, we can talk about that later. That's what you're interested in. Um, but the important thing was trying to deal with the uh, interop between C Sharp, which is a language that you know has different opinions, and uh, this API in particular was um, very, very OOE, and F Sharp. And you know, when you start talking to people and trying to figure out how do you do this, and uh, most of them said, you know, maybe check out Monads, and I was like, okay, this this will be fun. Um, so. Um, anyway, I thought, okay, but it's, it's like, okay, how do you do monads? Oh, monads, they're kind of like computation expressions, okay? So um, I started looking at computation expressions, 
and see, and these are nutrients, right? Okay, I call them, we call them otters. I, I didn't know the translation, I thought the word was really nice. But anyway, when I first looked at computation expressions, that was my face. I mean, I, I'm not <laughs> as cute, <laughs> but, but they, were, they were like, okay, fine, so what are these computation expressions? Um, okay, so I, I looked at an example, because you know, that's what you do. And, and you kind of look, some, this is like a simple one. You're like, okay, it, they're not that weird, but there's something weird about them. And, and that's kind of on purpose. So uh, at the top we have a builder. We'll talk about the builder in a second. And inside here, you have some code that looks, um, for those of you that don't do uh, F Sharp on a daily basis, um, this is a very ML-like language. So th this is kind of, this looks very normal for someone that does C F Sharp. And, but it's not exactly that. I mean, what is this band doing here? That's kind of, uh, this is not, you know, you know, it, it's something different happening. And also, if, even without knowing what exactly is happening, you know that on that lead with a bang, you do something, and then suddenly you can add these numbers. Okay, cool. Um, so you can do something, but, but even if you don't know what's going on, you know that you will add some numbers, and something makes 11 into a number. Uh, something called sum, it's an option type, um, and then you can add everything. So, so far, so you can go, okay, intuitively, I can say that this block of code will be reinterpreted, okay, I, maybe not so intuitively, but will be reinterpreted into something, and um, um, you have to have a builder, and something extraneous happens. Okay, that's, that's a good, good thing. So, we were talking about the builder, huh? This is a, a, an otter that is a builder. He looks very like, hey, let's do things. So I like to think of him, uh, also otters are cute. And uh, so a builder in, in, in F sharp and in computation expressions is simply a record of the operations that you can do. Some of the operations that we saw were let. Some of our operations that will turn, turn up uh, are um, for or, or so, which is fine. Um, the important thing is that the builder defines the syntax and semantics. So the semantics, what, what we're trying to say is that they will define the meaning of what we just saw there. So in this order computation ex expression example, there was a big pun there, um, you see that this is a different builder called I think, and here we have syntax defined by that builder, and the, you know, if you do do a normal F sharp, it will do something in a certain way, but this in here, we do it in a completely different way. And that allows us to run this exactly as you would think it should, right? So what is happening there, and this is what happens, is you start running and you print the date and time, you sleep for 2,000 milliseconds, and then you print it again. And you run it synchronously. If you wanna change that, you can change this, and then it will, you don't need to do anything else. So it's a simpler mental model. Um, the important thing that we're focusing on here is the builder and the computation expressions, which is the block that is within this uh, curly braces. Uh, another example, this, uh, there's an open source project called Embrace, which is super cool, and you should check it out. And uh, in here you have a builder called Cloud, and with that you're able to um, run this code that you're creating a string on a cloud. It seems a, like a little bit of heavy lifting just to create a, a string, right? But um, it's just an example. So what you need to imagine when you see this code is that someone wrote a builder for cloud and you're able to run it and you have a simpler model in your head. Um, and this is another example just to show you how things can change, which is kind of cool. So you're no need, you don't need to absorb everything here. We need to just, I'm just showing a bunch of examples that you can see. So, <laughs> so of course we have to get to this. Um, so I thought, okay, now I saw more or less that you, you can do some sort of weird thing behind the back on this um, squigglies and that code will, will be interpreted. <laughs> so possibly this is linked to how you implement uh, monads. So I went and did what anybody saying will do and uh, researched um, what is a, you know, what is monads. 
Um, and uh, you, I mean, come on, we've done it, right? I mean, nobody was born going like, you know what, I know this thing. Uh, maybe you did, anyway. Um, but the important thing is that we f I found this paper, probably the first one explaining monads in the, c in the context of uh, programming. And this guy um, is called Eugenio Moji. And, and this paper called Notions of Computations and Monads from 1991. So I, would, I did what everybody else would do, downloaded the paper, started reading it, go like, okay, mm -hmm, okay, I don't really get this. Because I found loads of maths and loads of maths that weren't just familiar to me, uh, slightly symbols that are slightly different to what I thought they would be. And I thought, okay, let, let's try some more one. Maybe I can come back to that one. And then I found this guy, right? Anybody, um, you know, I, I, if anybody's selling that t-shirt, I, I do want it. Um, <laughs> so this guy is Phil Wadler. And actually, even though um, the, the first comprehending monad paper was, I think, published in 91, um, himself and Eugenio Moji collaborated, or at least I think Eugenio explained to Phil some things. I, I don't know, I read something that said there was some sort of talking in between them. And um, the good thing is that he wrote a paper that is sl slightly easier to grok. Um, I got actually, he wrote a good, a good few. Um, the one that I would recommend or that I found easiest is monads for functional programming. So in this paper, he talks about purity. Now, papers are, are, are really cool because they allow you to learn kind of with the context of the idea of where everything was coming from. And this paper starts with something like, uh, shall I be pure or impure? And, uh, you know, it's kind of like, oh, wake up. Um, so purity is something that we, we want in our code, but we need to balance it with, uh, you know, reality and the fact that we need to get stuff done. <laughs> because, you know, if we were all on, you know, a little uh, abstract world, that would be great. But that's not where, where we live. We live in, like, you know, process some user data for something, calculate a trade, Except the academics that I, I actually have no idea what they do. One day, if you can tell me, guys, um, I'd love to know. Um, so anyway, the paper starts with the purity discussion, which I think we should have more often. And um, then he describes monads uh, and how to deal with the side effect um, with three examples, three concrete examples that everybody needs to do. Uh, he, he, he shows this uh, error handling. He shows... Uh, logging, and then he shows some sort of state management or something like that. So it's like, and then it keeps going, and you, you, you know, he shows you the solutions, and he shows you the abstraction, and that's great. Oh, look, I can see myself there. Um, so, but also in that paper, you have some, uh, what I call, not useful right away <laughs> info. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> for example, these three monad laws, and the fact that this whole thing of monads comes from category theory. Uh, and um, I thought, okay, I, that, that, that is good to know. I'll store it there in my brain. Um, so I thought, okay, that's great. I, um, okay, so how do I do this? We had this concept of computation expressions. We have this paper that we just read that it was in Haskell. So, you know, there, there's like these two inputs and how do we move on, right? Yeah, well, cool. Yes, yeah, someone is awake. Good. And so, um, so I thought I, I heard that thing. I don't know you, but I heard this thing that a monad is a monoid in the context of something. I know, I know. I'm, I, we, we, I didn't want to re repeat it. So, so I thought, okay, on, a monoid is a monoid. Okay, maybe I should start reading about monoids, right? Maybe it's a, it's a, it's a good thing because it seems logical, yeah. Okay, I, I thought it was logical, and I thought, well, worst case scenario, if I learn about monads and it's, you know, it doesn't lead me to the monad, at least I learn about the fact that, you know, what is a monoid, and because of that, I learn how to do these two things, you know, or maybe I learn what does it mean, you know, when, it, when it is, you should learn monads because it helps you to do these two things. I assume you cannot read, and I hate repeating, you cannot read. Yeah, cool. Okay, so. So I thought, okay, that, that seems kind of good because all I wanted was to learn about how to reason about this uh, concept. 
I thought, okay, how do you determine something is a monolith? You need a type and I need an operation, right? For programming, you have these two things pretty much all the time. Um, so when the, the properties that we need to have a monoid are these two, and you have these closures, and that means that for an operation, uh, the, that operation needs to get a type, get an R type, and finally return a type. So can anybody think of an example for that? Ex special prices of use cups and use bottles for whoever gets me the first. Plus, good, use tuple for Yenchai. <laughs> so, so, so yes, what, what would it be? Because you take something like an int, and then you take an R int, say three and four, and then finally you get a result of maybe some number. Um, actually, no, you don't get a maybe some number, you get seven. Um, so, and so this is int, int, int. Are we all okay? Okay, so I'll keep asking until I see an actual response because otherwise I think that either you know this so well that this is boring or that I'm losing you totally. So, you know, please, please tell me. So if we're sticking to the uh, summing uh, example, uh, we need an identity. So what that means is that you have zero, uh, sorry, if you have X being anything, say 10, and you add an identity, we'll say it's zero, the result is still 10. So um, if you have multiplication, the, the, the identity will be one. If you have a string concatenation, the uh, identity will be cool. Yeah, now you're getting this. <laughs> if, we, if we have lists, what would be the identity? No. <laughs> if we have lists, we'll have an empty list. Nearly so no, nil and empty list are not the same. Not, not, in, not, not in types. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, yes. I'll, we'll, we'll leave that go there. We'll let, let it hanging for a special after recording uh, chat. <laughs> so anyway, um, so we have these two things. See, now you're all awake and we're all playing together, which is nice. And um, so finally, for, for having monoids, we, we have this associativity property. And what that means is that um, no matter what order we apply the operation, um, they will be the same result. So in here, um, you have, say, one and parentheses, you evaluate this first, let's say, one and one. Uh, so this will be three. If we have the same numbers, this will be three as well. Cool? Okay, so this is not very difficult, I, I don't think. I think we dealt with harder problems in programming all the time. Um, so um, I thought, okay, so basically things, I don't need to do anything else to have money. I just need to know that is a thing, but maybe, just maybe, um, we can go through an example, right? So we have this example, we have a color type, uh, and we have RGBA, uh, byte is just a small n number, uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, and then you have an operation. Now, this is a test for you, and now you all think about it, is this a monoid? And I want you to think about it, and right now, when I said now, you will, uh, Raise your hand if you think it is. Okay, so three, <laughs> two, one. Raise your hand, okay, okay, good. Those of you that raised your hand, that was good. The rest of you are either fired or, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good, it's good. It's, uh, okay, so why is this a monoid? So first we'll have, we have a type and an operation. And this type, um, the, sorry, in this type is a type, so that's good, uh, and the operation. So the first rule was, we need a closure, and this operation, called that too, takes a color, um, so this color, see the way we have a nice uh, type validation color, and uh, we have that color, this is another color, and finally, it returns a color, so we have the signature that we need for closure, that's nice, right? Cool. Um, then, uh, an, another price of some sort of used uh, apple or something, uh, not an actual, you know, computer, that would be useful, I mean an eaten apple, uh, will go to whoever tells me what is the neutral for this, this, this pair. So what's neutral for the addition of two colors? Very good, you all get eaten apples, very good. <laughs> finally, <laughs> finally, I, I, ha I wish I had better prices. But, um, finally, we, we need to do this thing of uh, the associativity, is it associative? If we add different <laughs> colors in different orders, will we get the same color? Cool, 
Yes, we do. So we have monoids. Yes. Good. Well done. Uh, those of you that weren't so sure, now you can be sure. Um, so now we know about these two things. But the, the trick about this is that, OK, that's good. Um, what if I want some sort of safety? right? Well, you can, imp you can just add a type and uh, um, give you some sort of more security that uh, this is a monoid, so you have less hesitance. Like some of you were like, oh, I'm raising the hand, no, my arm hurts. I'm not actually terribly sure this is a monoid. Um, so maybe add a type. And then we can define a type that is a generic type, so you can do a monoid or anything. You put your neutral operation for the color example in here. You would, um, sorry, the, the neutral would be black. So it's, a, you know, it's an instance of, of the color, what's black. And you do the operation, that will be the zoom, uh, add, add color. Yeah, cool. And then uh, you can do something like this. Specifically for your example, you create this. And now you know, uh, the, you know, the compiler will tell you if you're doing something wrong, which is nice. Um, so you can do the p converting pairwise operation to list operation and do something pretty like this, um, which is nice. Uh, you know, you should be all going like, oh my God, this is amazing. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but what's more, um, you can not only, be because, uh, because um, you can use uh, property testing, you can actually verify the monoid laws. So you really, really need to not think about this. Now, uh, who knows what the property testing is and is very comfortable with this? Cool. The rest of you immediately go to the internet and download your favorite property testing tool in whatever favorite language you have. And this uh, is property testing code comes from uh, QuickCheck from Haskell. Um, there's a paper from the year around 2000, so nothing new. And the idea is that you randomly generate values for your test. So actually, these are called um, randomly generated tests. Property testing is the name that we all use and love <coughs> for uh, the reason that um, we have properties that we want to test. So the way this particular um, assertion work is that this would be a function. In, in F sharp, you can put spaces if you put uh, these quotes. So in case you're confused about why this is so. Um, and here we're asserting on neutral and asserting on associativity. And the framework, the FS check, our, um, FS check, will generate the many, many Ts, in this case colors, and will verify the neutral. Because we defined it up there in M neutral, in line four. And the FS check will verify that this equals dash, and then that equals dash. I see nodding or not nodding. Okay. Uh, and the same thing for associativity. So now instead of actually having to think uh, about things like is this actually a monoid, you can think about your problem a little bit more. Uh, so you now, knowing something, you remove a mental load on things that you should know and focus on what you need to solve, which is nice. So. Property testing, at least if you knew about monads but know about property testing, you want something. So, <laughs> this beautiful order makes me think of how nice it is to have something like monoids, to, you know, like nice little things that you put together, uh, and also others are nice, more so, so graceful when they swim, so clumsy when they are walking around on Earth. Anyway, that's nice. Um, that shouldn't be happening. Oh yeah, there we go. Okay. <laughs> I know, I know, no, but I see. I kind of wanted to see who who went for this. Yeah. So a monoid is a monoid in the category of random. Okay. So we know what a monoid is, and how to think about it. It's actually not a thing in itself, you know. But it's more like a thing you think about, which is nice. So so okay, you, you go, you read some other. Uh, um, a blog paper, and you read that a monoid is like a burrito. <laughs> good. It's, a, it's actually a really good, you know, reason for that. There are good reasons, but also you read something else. A monoid is like you would think. You think of them as you think about Legos. Have you ever stepped on one? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, that's what I was thinking. I was like, yeah, you can build stuff and you know compose it. 
but also painful. Okay, right, okay. Is that exactly what they meant? Um, so I was a little bit confused and, uh, you know, okay, what do I do? I, it's better than my face, right? And then um, you have this news. This is real news from a real newspaper in Ireland where I'm from. <laughs> Okay. Just, just for context, this, this is a guy, like, you know, nice uh, little padding, and <laughs> <laughs> Thurman Otter, okay? So how, how, similar, how similar did I feel that this, that this was a really good example of how we think of something and how something like a concept of a monad that might or might not be huge and extensive and, you know, otters are beautiful, complicated things. You know, but are we are we really sure we want to be so afraid of these? Um, I don't think so. I think it, it might be better if we just start talking about them and learn of them and start trying to see who's got a better monad or whatever. You know, is that is that really necessary? Can we not just you know get along? Um, probably, I'm sure someone will write the response that no, we can't get along. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it's okay. Um, so what we'll do. Uh, oh yeah, we're missing a picture, I forgot, that, that's why. So, um, so what we'll do instead of uh, starting to try to define things concisely, we'll just 